Lakeland Currents, your public affairs program for North Central Minnesota. Production funding for Lakeland Currents is made possible by Bemidji Regional Airport, serving the region with daily flights to Minneapolis-St. Paul International Airport. More information available at BemidjiAirport.org. Closed captioning for Lakeland Currents is sponsored by Niswa Tax Service, tax preparation for businesses and individuals, online at niswatax.com. Hello again, friends. I'm Jason Edens, your host of Lakeland Currents. Thanks for joining the conversation today, and thanks for your ongoing support of Lakeland Public TV. From Mille Lacs to the Mississippi headwaters, many lakes and rivers within our region are infested with aquatic invasive species, or AIS. How concerned should we be? Is this a fight we're winning, or is it a losing cause? What can you do about it? Here to help us answer those questions and more are my two guests today. Dana Gutzman is the point person on AIS for Cass County, and Susan Coring is the president of the Pelican Lake Association. Dana and Susan, welcome to the program, and thanks for making time for our conversation. Thanks, Jason. Yeah, thank you for having us. Absolutely. Well, first of all, Dana, I have a question for you. Your role at the county is full-time, and from my perspective, that really suggests that this is a big problem. Can you tell me what you do on a day-to-day -day basis at the county? Yeah, day-to-day -day is kind of a tough question because it is always changing. Um, summertime, it's a lot more focused on actual AIS monitoring, working with the inspectors at the different accesses, um, doing some outreach with the resorts and a lot with the lake associations as well. I attend lake association annual meetings and some of the bigger lake associations that do regular board meetings. I like to attend those when they invite me to, okay. which is really nice for that education and engagement with the public. Um, day to day, I'm also doing some data work, looking at the inspections from last year, working on the reports, getting stuff together for next season. I'm really excited this year to be doing a lot more resort outreach coming up here. So I get to go to the North Country Buyers Show um, next week, which this may not have aired yet by then, but I'm really excited to engage with some resorts there at the Casino and Walker. I get to participate at Frost Fest on February 26th on Leech Lake and do some AIS education games with the kids. So Interesting. it really is a varied position. But Sounds diverse. Yes, finding things to do year round is not an issue right now. Okay. Well, Susan, in your case, as the president of the Pelican Lake Association, what's your role in this fight against AIS? Thank you, Jason. Uh, AIS is definitely. It, been an issue with us since 2012 on Pelican Lake, actually Pelican Lake and Little Pelican, which is in Crow Wing County. So since 2012, we've had an infestation in Big Pelican with zebra mussels, and prior to that, we've had some um, curly leaf pond weed, but that's been the extent of it. But we're trying to stay on top of it since Lake uh, Ossawin McKee in 2003 was infested, and then we started to get some management plans going, so we were always watching for our invasion in our lake. Hmm, interesting. Well, before we get too far, I'm curious to know how many of these species are in our region, Dana? Are we talking about one or 100? So in Cass County, we do have Starry Stonewort, um, which is kind of the new kid on the block for AIS. It is in Leech Lake and Cass. And um, really, our region has the most starry stonewort going Leech Lake and North. Can, the only one down in the cities is Lake Coronas. Um, so we also have zebra mussels in a handful of lakes. I'd say four or five offhand, but I'd slow down to count them. <laughs> um, we have Eurasian water milfoil um, just in, I think, four lakes in the county. Um, and those are actually being treated and managed very well by our lake associations and the infestations are not real large with those. And then we do have some curly leaf pond weed and kind of the less talked about AIS um, mystery snails. So there's Chinese and banded mystery snails and those are the AIS that if you were to go out to the edge of your lakeshore property, you're really probably likely to see them. They were spread around a little earlier before the big AIS fight got really involved, so there are more lakes than you would think they're in, but we're really lucky that they weren't zebra mussels because mm. they really don't have the impact on the lake ecology that we see with AIS like zebra mussels. Well, speaking of zebra mussels, they're in Pelican, as you just mentioned, Susan. Where did they come from originally? <laughs> zebra mussels 
came from actually, they're from uh, European area over into even the Caspian Sea and the Black Sea and coming through the routes of, of transportation they eventually ended up in the ballasts of boats and into the Great Lakes, uh, into the St. Lawrence um, Seaway and then eventually came and by 1989 was on in Lake Superior. Well, relating to zebra mussels, first of all. So they came all the way from Central Asia yeah. through ballast water to the Duluth port and then to Central Minnesota. Through transportation of boats, our rotation of boats throughout the state in 1989 was on Lake Superior and then it was into the Mississippi and then it eventually came to our lakes uh, through transport of uh, fishermen and transport of boats or even other watercraft. Hmm. That's a long journey. Yes. Well, why are zebra mussels even a big deal? My understanding is that zebra mussels actually increase water clarity and water clarity is positively correlated with property values. So what's the big deal? Which one of us do you want to take Dana? that? Well, let me, I guess I'll start with saying just the impacts on the lake ecology in general. Um, there's some good studies out there being done by the Minnesota Aquatic Invasive Species Research Center showing the effects that they have on walleye growth in the year of young in particular. So first year walleyes aren't getting as big in zebra mussel infested lakes, which would then affect their winter survival rates. Walleyes do a little better in some of the more turbid waters. They don't do as good in the crystal clear waters. I'm sure Susan can elaborate yeah, on some stuff on well, that. Well, many people ask me, well, what does a zebra mussel look like? It looks like a more of a, uh, uh, the letter D, but it's got also a little, um, call it a basil that comes out of, this, out of it that helps it fluctuate into the waters when the zebra mussels are created or when the velgers are, are laid, which is one zebra mussel can lay up to 30,000 um, velgers within one cycle and up to a, a million in a season. So within a couple of weeks they end up attaching to hard, hard surfaces and that's how they materialize. Uh, but they can siphon up to a liter of water a day which takes all the nutrients and all the uh, phyllopointin and some of the minimal uh, zooplankton out of the water, which is nourishment for our other um, minnows and, and fish. And sure. then it clears the water because it takes all of the, the nutrients out. And then they also release the bacteria that they don't want, and then that's in our waters. So I'm hearing you say that basically it's competition. Zebra mussels are competing with yes. indigenous or endemic organisms, and that's really the challenge. Is that right? Yes. Yes. So if, if zebra mussels got here in 1989, when did AIS really come onto the radar in the state of Minnesota? The state funding for the county programs, I believe was 2014. Yeah. So that's where they really started saying, all right, each individual county, you get this set amount based on your number of public water accesses and public parking spots mm -hmm. for boat trailers at those water accesses. And please use this money to help in the AIS prevention. So prior to that, we weren't really doing anything? We weren't doing a lot at the statewide levels. Interesting. Correct. So it's, it's, it's interesting because we're doing a history book on the lake, so I've been doing a lot of research. And even back when Lake Oswin McKee was uh, initiated with zebra mussels in 2003, in 2004 there was this big discussion and there was also how do we eradicate them? And the same discussion and here all of a sudden it's 2022 and where are we uh, with? Well, that's what I want to talk about now. What do we do about this? So, for example, at, in Pelican Lake, it is invested right now. What can you do at the lake level to actually mitigate or even eliminate an infestation? What's, what's the strategy, Dana? So, right now, there is no approved lake-wide treatment of zebra mussels. So, there's research being undertaken. I think that that research, hopefully, is really going in some positive directions, but we are talking years before we see some of that research technique really hit the lakes. Did I hear you say that nothing really is approved right now to address an infestation? Of zebra mussels. Of zebra mussels, specifically. Yes. 
But yes. yet, Susan, didn't Pelican Lake just try some sort of lake-wide strategy? It has been known within, prior to coming to Pelican Lake last July, they have done work on Lake Minnetonka on testing copper with the use of the zebra mussels. So what they wanted to do was try some different lakes with different uh, ecology or um, water quality and see what the difference was in the dosage of the copper that they're utilizing in, in its effects on also missile, minnows, minnows, other fish, uh, Daphne is another one. Um, when they came for 20 days in July on property on the east side of Pelican, they had eight tanks with not only the, the velgers of the zebra mussels and testing the water as it came out of the lake, but they also looked at other four other fish and um, native, native snails to see what, it's, what the dosage of the copper needed to be to not affect the other, other water life versus the, the velgers or the zebra mussels. I want to make sure I'm understanding you. Are you saying that they applied copper to the lake or they tried this treatment outside of the lake in some sort of experimental tank? They Can took the water from the lake into these different tanks on a daily basis over 10 days, even though they were there for 20 days and they would test different dilutions of the copper on these um, specimens that they had in the tanks. And then they would have to they could not put the water back into the lake. It had to be uh, disposed elsewhere. Because it's not approved, right? Not approved. They were able to get approval to do a in-bay study at Lake Minnetonka prior to this study on Pelican Lake. So that was kind of the groundwork of, and it's a low-dose copper um, zebra mussel suppression technique. So what they're actually, I think we're trying to fine tune in looking at that water chemistry, it's, which is really, has different effects on it. So they're looking at different lakes with different water chemistry to try to see how low of a dose of copper they can put into a system to still kill the zebra mussel villagers, but not have the effects or lower the effects on the other species like fathead minnows, daphnia, walleye. So they're just furthering that study and research. Interesting, so what did they learn here at Pelican Lake? We haven't had the results yet because okay. they were working on it through the winter. So is this moving us in the direction where we could apply this at the whole lake level? Is that the goal with these studies, potentially? I had understood that they could only treat a half lake, half uh, portion of a lake at a time. Because, because of, of toxicity, of or why is that? Well, you realize you have other wildlife, you have other wildlife in the sure. waters, and especially minnows that are affected by, especially affected by the copper. So you want to have the most minimal dose, and when you broadly treat, that's, it's affecting all the other life in the water. The entire lake ecology. Is it harmful to humans? Well, not be. we don't know yet. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so it's to be determined. So this is really cutting edge research because we don't yet have an answer for how to eliminate an infestation is what I'm hearing, is that right? Yeah, and that's why they aren't looking at those whole lake applications yet. They're doing their diligence, they're finding out the effects that it has on all the other species to figure out is, do the benefits outweigh the costs? Mm -hmm. And what are those costs? How can we decide if we don't know what it's gonna cost the lake? Okay, now you use the term suppression, not elimination. Is that because we're trying to manage our expectations or because we don't actually think we can eliminate them? How does that work? With the low-dose copper, that technique that they're speaking about and the fact that more than likely we wouldn't get to a point where they do a whole lake, it mm -hmm. probably would just be suppression because those villagers are releasing, like Susan said, up to a million eggs a season. Those villagers from zebra mussels living on the other side of the lake can still go around the lake. They are doing more research. There's some, I hate to say the word, biocontrol efforts, research being conducted, because that can be a scary word for people, depending on how you understand it. But what does it mean? <laughs> so working on, see, and this is where you're getting into the science that I don't want to mess anything up, but um, I believe they're actually working on an mRNA technique, similar to what we all know with our COVID vaccines. 
um, so that the zebra mussels would not be able to, Susan, you're going to have to help me out on this, r reproduce and continue to do what they do. So whether, and I don't think they, like this is, would be the cutting edge, this sure. is all in the lab, but I think they're trying to figure out where they could use this. So would they use it to affect that thread that they attach by? Would they use it on their filtering capacity? How can they affect the zebra mussels so that they can't continue to survive as well as they do? The idea is try to eliminate the velgers because eventually they grow to be the zebra mussels and the more you can go up front, eventually that should take that away. But zebra mussels over a period of time can eat themselves out. So there's times in the one year might be less than, than in other years. For instance, under my dock, there's, there could be a lot. And I'm out there trying to get them up and take them out. Well, that's where I found you just don't put them in a box because they live a while and then they also start smelling. So uh, it's an experience uh, that you never know until you try something. Interesting. Well, we're focused right now just on zebra mussels, but the strategy for suppressing AIS must be specific to the species, right? So when we're looking at some of these other AIS that are in Cass County or Crow Wing County, how do we deal with some of those other species? So you mentioned starry stonewort, is that correct? Yes. And there's curly... Leaf pondweed. Thank and you. So what are the strategies for addressing either one of those? The curly leaf pondweed is a little bit more straightforward. Um, there's been some chemical treatments and mechanical treatments to work on those. Um, curly leaf pondweed is nice in the fact that it likes to grow early um, before our native plants. So chemical treatments when applied at the appropriate time and the appropriate temperatures can be done in an effective way to decrease the growth of the curly leaf pondweed and not harm as many native plants as if it was a different growing season and time. Um, if you get that curly leaf pond, we'd suppress at the beginning of that growing season, they don't put out their turions, which are like a seed for regrowth. So years after years, if you keep getting it before that regrowth, that seed is being planted, you can knock down that plant. Okay, so that's curly leaf pondweed, and then yes. starry stonewort, just briefly, I'm assuming there's a different strategy altogether, or no strategy. So starry stonewort, we don't have an effective technique. The best thing, I, I shouldn't say, the best thing is catching it small, and then we stand a chance. Okay. Right now, with the current research, there are some chemical treatments, but they don't seem to, it's still spreading throughout lakes that are using those chemical treatments. Um, it's an algae, not a vascular plant, so mm -hmm. those chemicals have to hit every part of the plant to kill it instead of like Eurasian water milfoil or curly leaf pondweed where it gets taken up into the system. I see. So it is a different beast. Um, at Leech Lake we used a diver assisted suction harvesting with the Leech Lake Band of Ojibwe and the DNR. Um, and that's really exciting. There's some planning in the works for um, some more research on that to make to see if it is going to be an effective control of starry stone sure. and, and that's the new kid on the block you that's say. the new kid on the block so there's a lot to learn there yet so it seems like the best approach then is managing the infestations and ensuring that they don't spread to other lakes correct yes so tell me about how lake associations and the public sector, whether it's the county or the state, how are the two of you collaborating? Now, I understand that you two are in different counties, mm -hmm. so you two may not be working together directly, but assuming you were in the same county, how, do, how does a lake association partner with the county? Well, we, the county has been given money through the DNR um, to do so many inspections in their ac water accesses. And for instance, at Pel on Pelican, we have four accesses. Three of them are public. So with their checking on the number of, in, in the past, and checking how many inspections are done, we're allowed a, so many inspections in a season. So each of our four accesses are allowed 520 um, inspection hours because we have two and a half inspections an hour, and that's how they uh, tabulate that. So it's important that when the boat comes in that they're clean before they go into the water and then when they come out they're also checked. Uh, so it, the, the thought is the clean dry, drain and dry method to make sure your, your boat is clean and is drained 
uh, the plugs are out and then it's dry and before you go to another um, boat axis, mm -hmm. you should at least be out for five days or go to a decon station which is high, high water, high hot water powered uh, like over 120 degrees. And also make sure that uh, you dispose of your bait because the bait is also carrying that water from mm -hmm. one place to another. So to utilize uh, bottled water or um, septic, uh, or not septic, but drain, uh, well water sure. mm -hmm. um, to, to utilize with your bait. So how many users of our incredible lakes know about the importance of cleaning, draining, and drying, clean, drain, drying? More people are doing it than you think. Okay. 99% of boats arriving in Cass County last year that mm -hmm. were inspected by Cass County inspectors arrived without their drain plugs in. So we inspected 26,000 boats. So 260 people either didn't know the law or honestly we see a lot of, well, I just live two houses down. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's, I mean, that information people have gotten it. It's been a law since 2010 that you have to have that drain plug out when you're traveling. So I think people are really learning that they're really doing it. Cleaning the trailers is important. Understanding the bait water connection, that water in your motor. You need to tilt your motor mm -hmm. down after you get out of the access to drain the residual water out of there. You'll get a cup or two out of it depending on the size of the motor and the make, which is the reason you do that is those zebra mussel villagers again they could be in that water um the other big thing like you said not really um the bait water but not throwing the bait back into the lake too that's one where people are often unaware still mm -hmm. that we're really still working to get that education out so there's risk of disease with the bait they're in crowded spaces together so if one gets sick they're more likely to all get sick mm -hmm. um the other thing with bait is carp can get into those minnows too. So it, depending on where your bait is collected and where you buy your bait, there is a risk that you have carp in there and they look a lot like some of the minnows that we use. So if you're doing the right thing, you feel like it's a good thing, I'm gonna just put this bait into the lake and fish are gonna eat it, but it's actually a really high risk to release that live bait. So there are all these different vectors that pose a risk, but, but the county, the state can't monitor all lakes, right? There are certainly lakes. I mean, Pelican Lake is kind of a, an iconic lake, right? But there are many smaller lakes that don't necessarily have monitored accesses. Okay. Is that right? So what are we doing there? That's where we have to hope that our education is really getting out there. Those people arriving at Pelican with their drain plugs out are doing those same steps. We're changing behavior. We're getting people to do clean drain, dry dispose everywhere they're going. The, the county also allows for you, if you're on a particular lake and you don't have any infestation, such as we have a little pelican that doesn't, uh, we can take a test monitor in and have it checked. So we have people uh, aware of and doing that process. Some folks are using our beautiful lakes again, not through a public access, but through a resort access. So what are you doing on Pelican Lake in order to educate resort owners about that risk, well, that vector? Breezy Point definitely is one of our accesses, even though, um, and they do get the hours for mm -hmm. it. So they also have our, the state monitor, or the county monitors or inspectors that they're at the site, and they get those 520 hours also. So Danny, you mentioned earlier that you work with a lot of resorts, and you'll be attending an event here shortly. Tell us a little bit more about what you do in order to make sure that our resorts are partners in this fight and not culprits. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, every resort I've interacted with in the last year has been really receptive. They do care. They are busy, busy people, as you can imagine, running seasonal resorts. Um, so they're, I think a lot of them really have the best of intentions in mind. One of the things that my big projects for the summer is getting all of the resorts the informational signs to stop aquatic hitchhikers giving people that information at the access. Maybe they only go to their house and then that resort and back home and they don't ever go to a public access for that education. So we wanna make sure that those resorts have those signs and information, and especially resorts on infested waters, making sure they have the infested water signs that the DNR puts up at all the public accesses. We're making sure the resorts have those signs too. So I'll be traveling around and just talking to all the resorts and giving them the signs, the information, education, to hang on the fridges, or 
but wherever at the resorts. <laughs> How do we monitor lakes that we haven't necessarily been monitoring to date because there hasn't been an infestation. How, we, how are we learning about new infestations? AIS detectors are a wonderful group of volunteers educated through the University of Minnesota's um, Outreach Extension Program. They have a class coming up this spring. You can do it all online. There's locations you can actually go for in-person training as well. If you're a Cass County resident and you wanna take it, you can email me and we can get you signed up. We have an in-person class coming in Bacchus this spring. Um, those detectors go around, they check their own lakes, they volunteer and check other lakes, and what they're doing, they're literally throwing a rake, pulling it in, and identifying the different species that are on it. And you get snails, mussels if they're in there, and the vegetation as well. And this is a volunteer gig, is that right? Yes, yes. Uh, I became an AIS detector in 2017 when they first uh, start of the program and now as of Monday I'm taking an AIS uh, management 101 class which I think I believe 111 people have already taken so it's it's an online but gives you the opportunity to identify native and invasive um, whether it's aquatic plants or zebra mussels or whatever and the treatments it gives an individual whether they're like association or a, a person around the lake or anybody interested in taking the program. So we're really depending on the goodwill of our neighbors to make sure that AIS is not spreading to other lakes in Minnesota. I want to know if the two of you are optimistic. Do you think that we can manage AIS? I do. I believe we can because we need to get everyone individually uh, in tune to what's important for our future, for the future of our children and the future of our properties. And if we can just kind of control and know what's going on around us and avoid any other starry stonework coming into the lake, because once it comes in, it's there. So if we can just avoid new infestations. Final word, Dana, are you optimistic? I am. I really am. I think a lot more lakes would have AIS by now if we weren't already doing the right thing. Well, okay. I really appreciate the work that both of you do on behalf of your communities and our entire state and our state's ecology. Thank you for joining me today. Thank you. Yeah. And thank all of you for joining me once again. I'm Jason Eatons, your host of Lakeland Currents. You can follow the story on Twitter. Tweet us at CurrentsPBS. Be kind and be well. We'll see you next week.